Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Wound Care Today Facebook Live. Um, a massive thank you to you all for joining us tonight. I'm well aware how precious your time is, and also on such an incredibly glorious summer's evening. Um, so I do hope that some of you have made it outside with a tablet or a phone um, and are able to watch this with something cold. Uh, tonight's event is called Negative Wound Therapy with Hard to Heal Wounds. And our speaker tonight is the amazing Caroline Dowsett, a nurse consultant in tissue viability, um, and also one of the preeminent forces in UK and global wound care over the last 28 years. So it's a real privilege for us to have Caroline with us tonight. Um, thank you so much and good evening. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Ed. And thank you for inviting me along. It's my pleasure to join you. No, no, thank you, and good luck tonight. I hope it goes well. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, Caroline's doing tonight's event from home, so please bear with us if we have any technology problems. We'll get them sorted out as soon as possible. Um, the event will be available on our Facebook Live platform in perpetuity. We will also make sure the event is on our website, and all the slides will be available to download from the website, so don't worry about scribbling notes throughout this session. Um, the link to the certificate of attendance will be posted right at the end of this event by our admin assistant for tonight, Mr. Alec O'Dare. So thank you, Alec, for doing that. Um, so that will come up and you can download that then. Um, as Caroline will confirm, the more involved and engaged you are tonight, the better it will be for her and for the event in general. So please feel free to post any relevant comments and also um, ask and challenge Caroline with any questions you may have during the evening, and she will endeavor to answer as many as possible at the end of the session tonight. Um, so before we start, I, I would massively like to thank our partners for tonight's event and across our whole business, Will Smith and Nephew. Um, without your passion for wound healing and your commitment to independent education, these events simply could not and would not happen. So thank you so much from me and from the entire team. Um, so without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to tonight's speaker, Caroline Dowsett. Over to you, Caroline. Thank you very much, Ed. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Wound Care Today and our sponsor, Smith & Nephew, um, for allowing me to share my knowledge and my experience of managing hard to heal wounds and the use of negative pressure wound therapy, in particular focus on single use negative pressure wound therapy, as most of my work is in the community setting. So the learning objectives um, for this evening session is to understand what a heart to hear wound is and the impact that that has on the patient, on us as clinicians and on the wider health economy. I'd like to discuss the factors that contribute to heart to hear wounds and focus in on the patient assessment and the overall patient management. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about negative pressure wound therapy so that we understand um, the role of negative pressure wound therapy and single use negative pressure wound therapy in improving outcomes for patients with hard to heal wounds. Well, I guess it's worth starting off with a definition of what a hard to heal wound is. And a hard to heal wound has been defined as one that fails to heal with standard therapy in an orderly and timely manner. Now, some studies suggest 12 weeks for this, but I guess we don't wait 12 weeks managing a patient um, to decide whether that wound is hard to heal or not. So we shouldn't wait that period of time. We should be assessing patients at each dressing change, and we should be measuring and recording the wound changes um, dimensions every four weeks. So wound area reduction of four weeks, we should be doing for all patients. And that gives us an indication of whether that wound is um, hard to heal. We know that hard to heal wounds have a significant impact on our patients and on their quality of life, but they also place a burden on our healthcare systems globally. We know that between 1.5 and 2 million people in Europe suffer from an acute or chronic wound, and the average duration for those wounds is 9 to 12 months. But 30%, almost 30%, 29% of those wounds remain unhealed at one year. And for some patients in the region of 18%, they'll have had their wound for one to five years. So for these patients, an, an immense amount of suffering. And I guess, you know, the learning from tonight is that we can do something about that um, by the, the way that we assess and manage our patients. 
But I think we have to remember when we're talking about hard to heal wounds, we need to remember that it's the patient that's complex. So the patient um, has complexities that lead to that wound being hard to heal. And we know that 76% of patients with a chronic wound have three or more comorbidities. And when you look at your case loads, I'm sure you can resonate with that. 46% of people have diabetes. And I work in East London where we've got a really high prevalence of diabetes. So we have a lot of patients um, that are quite challenging in terms of trying to heal their wounds. And then we know that obesity is on the rise, 52% of the adult population across Europe are overweight, and 17% are obese. And if we look, for example, at um, surgical dehist wounds, which can be challenging and hard to heal, patients with underlying comorbidities, people with diabetes, and people who are overweight are all predisposed to having um, a surgical wound complication and a wound dehist. So we need to think about how we manage um, these underlying comorbidities. But of course, we have to start with the real challenge and the real challenge is for the patient. We go into the patient's home, we go to the ward and we, we engage with the patient and we carry out the wound care. But the patient is the one that has to live with that wound. And patients report um, that wounds are painful, they cause distress to them. For many patients, they lose their independence. And I've seen that many times in the community setting. Some patients uh, become socially isolated. And I remember a patient when I was a community nurse whose wound was very offensive smelling and the family and grandchildren stopped coming to that patient's house and it was very difficult uh, to turn that situation around. So many patients have to live with chronic wounds as a long-term condition and we need to think about our interventions that can change that um, and change people's lives. But they also pose a challenge to us as clinicians in terms of healthcare professional time to treat. And we know that 79% of chronic wounds are managed in the community setting. So that will be practice nurses, GPs, um, district nurses, um, and other people who work in the community setting. And I think one of the challenges um, for all of us working in those settings is to ensure that the knowledge, the skills, and the competencies of people who are providing the care are up to date and ensuring the clinicians are working um, to prevent and manage complications. Because I think one of the challenges I see is that we don't always recognize that we've got um, a wound care complication and we're late in referring for specialist advice. So what I'd like to see is much earlier identification of wounds that fail to heal and referral to specialist services and starting advanced wound therapy, such as neck depression wound therapy. But of course, we have to think of the broader context and we have to think of the strategic um, objectives of our organization. So we need to think about the commissioners who commission care and how they make the decisions that they make when they're prioritizing care for patients. And we have to think about our healthcare providers, our employers, and how they make the decision about what business cases get through when we're looking for funding for some of these therapies. Um, and obviously care is increasing all the time and there's multiple demands on limited resources. Combined with that, there's a drive for efficiencies and reducing waste and a drive to show or demonstrate that we are improving outcomes for patients. So I think we are in an arena where we have to constantly demonstrate um, our, our value for money when we're providing wound care services. But ultimately, we should remember that poor quality care costs more. So if it takes longer to heal that patient's wound, the costs will go up. So the sooner we heal it, the better in terms of the patient experience and the cost of care. So what we know is that delayed wound healing appears to be common. We read that in the literature. We see that in our practice. It's frequently not recognized early enough. And that increases clinical workloads and costs. And I think what I see with overstretched community nursing services is that sometimes they don't actually have the time to pause and think about the wound care that they're giving. And patients are scheduled Monday, Wednesday, Friday visits, Tuesday, Thursday visits. Um, and sometimes we need to actually step back and analyze those caseloads and see how we could reduce our clinical workloads. And I'm going to give you some solutions um, this evening because it's not all about about raising the, um, the, the challenges. It's about what are the solutions in terms of um, being proactive here. So I think we need to be proactive, first of all, in um, assessing patients early and intervening for them um, so that we can reduce this burden to the patient, to you, 
healthcare professionals out there this evening tuned in, thinking about what can I do differently and to the overall health economy. So I think assessment is key to managing heart to heal wounds. And that's assessment of the patient, assessment of the wound, and assessment of that environment of care and the resources available to you. So if we look at patient-related factors, we know that age, for example, impacts on wound healing. We know that peripheral arterial disease impacts on wound healing, and it's very difficult to control those. You can't really do much about your age, um, as we all know. Uh, maybe you can change the arterial status if you uh, get your vascular surgeon on board. But I think we have to think about what we can control in patients who have heart to heal wounds. And I'm thinking in particular about um, smoking cessation. So smoking contributes to delayed wound healing. Obesity, as we've said, is um, an issue for patients in terms of getting their wound healed. So we need to think about the public health messages that we can give out um, to help get our patients healed in terms of the patient related factors. And then if we move on to the wound related factors in terms of our assessment, uh, many of you will be familiar with the time acronym, so the tissue assessment, um, infection, moisture balance and wound age. And I think we need to assess the wound bed um, and then we need to think about what our interventions might be to optimise wound bed preparation. And then if we think about the broader environment as part of our assessment, um, we need to think about who, do we, who are we delegating wound care too. And I sometimes see that it's the more junior nurses that get to manage these hard to heal wounds when you've got team leaders who may have the expertise who really should be doing that regular reassessment of their caseload. So thinking about the competency and how we can address competency issues in uh, wound management. And then we have resource and treatment related factors that we need to think about. Um, and I think it's about how do we access advanced wound therapies for our patients um, so that we can make a difference. And that's about really making a business case and demonstrating that these things work for patients. Moving on from assessment, if we look at the management of heart to heal wounds, our management plan should include getting that diagnosis right. So correct diagnosis of the wound etiology and treatment of the underlying cause. So if we've got a patient who's got a venous leg also, then we want to compress that leg with compression therapy. If we've got a patient who's got a pressure also, we want to offload that pressure. And likewise for a patient who's got a diabetic foot also. We want to manage those underlying comorbidities and, and factors that impact on wound healing that we've just discussed. And then we want to apply the principles of wound bed preparation. So, you know, debridement of necrotic tissue, prevention and management of infection, management of um, excess moisture, making sure the wound is not too wet, not too dry, and getting that edge advancement so that we can heal the wound. And I guess the E for me has often been about evaluating the wound as well. And I think it's really important to do that measurement um, every four weeks so that you know whether you're getting a result from your, um, your, your treatment for the patient. So the ongoing reassessment and evaluation and of course documentation. If we haven't documented what we're doing then we haven't done it. So I'd like to talk a little bit about negative pressure wound therapy now in managing these hard to heal wounds. And negative pressure wound therapy is the controlled application of sub-atmospheric pressure to the local wound environment using a sealed wound dressing which is connected to a vacuum pump. And there are many examples of wound types that we can use negative pressure wound therapy on. So hard to heal wounds, which is the subject area for tonight, but you can also use it on flaps and grafts, closed surgical incisions, um, meta-analysis, some, some high level evidence um, of the benefits of negative pressure wound therapy in closed surgical incisions, acute wounds, partial thickness burns, ulcers, subacute and dehist wounds. So it can be used in a, in, in a broad spectrum of wounds. If we look at the uh, mechanisms of action, um, it protects the wound from the external contamination. It removes wound fluid and reduces the risk of maceration, which is a, a big complication of um, some of these hard to heal wounds. It reduces oedema, increases blood flow and promotes granulation tissue formation and epithelialization. Now, I'd like to share my um, experience of using single-use negative pressure wound therapy. And I guess all of this, uh, this is uh, it published in um, Wounds International, a peer review publication. Um, and I guess 
my interest comes from my curiosity and those of you who are joining who know me will know that I'm very curious um, about how we deliver women care and I'm a, I'm a bit of a why person, I can be difficult sometimes because I want to know why are we doing it, what can we do different and how can we improve what we're doing. So I guess getting involved in this study was really about trying to find some answers around when do we use next single use negative depression wind therapy, who should we use it on? What's the best patient to use it on? How long should we use it on? And I know my colleague Jane Hampton in Denmark, who uh, co-authored this uh, publication, um, as well as some colleagues in the health economics department at Smith and Nebu, we all were very curious to know what's the most effective use of this therapy. So it, it's a multi-centered um, economic evaluation study with 52 patients. And what we did is we developed and implemented a pathway um, for use of single-use depression wound therapy to kickstart heart to heal wounds and then we evaluated the impact of that on clinical outcomes and on cost. So as part of this study we developed a pathway um, and as part of that pathway we had an entry criteria so wounds that were greater than six weeks and um, who were not reducing in size in four weeks um, prior to starting treatment that weren't infection, infected um, and that we treated the underlying cause. So if it was a pressure ulcer, we'd offload it. If it was a surgical uh, a venous leg ulcer, we were doing compression as well as negative pressure wound therapy. And then we monitored the response um, to see what the reduction in wound area was. And we put the, as part of the path where we had three um, uh, categories, so less than 10% reduction in four weeks of treatment, then that was a non-responder. So we wouldn't waste the resource. Uh, we would refer those patients. Um, and optimize their care in a different way. If we got a response that was greater than 40% wound reduction area uh, within four weeks, then we knew that that was a good responder. Um, and then for those patients who had a response between 10 and 40%, we would do um, uh, an evaluation or um, use our clinical judgment to decide to continue or not um, single use negative pressure wound therapy. So it was quite structured and measuring and monitoring along the way, including um, costs and, and visits. So you can see here the results of this uh, multi-center economic evaluation. Um, there was a significant improvement in wound area reduction. So wound area reduction by 13.4% more than the pre pico rate. And I think what you have to remember here is that a lot of these wounds were static. In fact, some of these wounds were getting bigger. Um, so they weren't just hard to heal, they were also static. 94.1% um, of wounds of less than three months duration um, healed or were projected to, uh, projected to heal within 12 weeks. So I think the message here was that the sooner you started the treatment, um, the better the result. And then, of course, we save money. And I think one of the issues when we're talking to our commissioners is often that um, they say that it's an expensive treatment. But of course, what we were able to show is because we healed patients quicker, um, that it wasn't as costly as standard treatment that was prolonged with no good outcome for the patient. So the cost savings were in the region of 33% um, for negative, single use negative pressure versus standard treatment. So we saved in the region of 50,000 over a 26 week period. And you know, when we go back to our commissioners and we were able to um, articulate that, um, it stands up very well in terms of being able to get that resource. And then I think the good news story for our community nurses is that we're able to say that well, if you if you get this, you embrace this and you get on board, we actually can reduce your workload. So time to care, um, 119 days released over 26 um, weeks. So I think um, overall, um, we can see that not only we're improving patient care, um, we're also saving money and freeing up um, nurses' valuable time. Now that study, as I said, is available to replicate. Um, you can use the pathway and you can, um, you can get that going with your patients on your caseload. And that is exactly what the McCluskey um, and colleagues group did in Ireland on a, a sample of 36 um, patients and they had similar results. So what they found was 84.6% healing rate for wounds of less than three months duration. So you'll see here from the charts that again, the sooner you start um, treatment, the better the healing rates. Um, but still, three to six months, 71.4% is also very good. But of course, the longer you leave these hard to heal wounds, the more challenging they are 
for us, but also for um, therapies. And what they found that not only did the dressing change reduce during the period that they were using single use neck compression therapy, but that was sustained when they stopped. So the wound was on a healing trajectory and they were able to reduce dressing changes. And the overall cost savings for this study were between 21 and 25% of the total cost. So again, it's good to see that um, other people are embracing the pathway and getting some good results for their patients. One of the questions people sometimes ask is, well, do I use traditional negative pressure wound therapy or would I use single-use negative pressure wound therapy? And I'd like to share um, this work by Dr. Robert um, Kistner and his colleagues um, in, in the US. And they did a randomized, um, prospective randomized controlled trial on the efficacy of single-use negative pressure wound therapy system compared to traditional negative pressure wound therapy in the treatment of chronic ulcers of the lower extremities. And what they found very interestingly is that there was a 39% greater reduction in the single-use negative pressure wound therapy group of patients versus traditional um, therapy. And again, 32.5% greater reduction in wound debt and 91% in wound volume. And wound closure was 51% um, in the patients achieving uh, using the single use negative pressure wound therapy. So I guess we're now moving on in our thinking, um, and I think this is good news for patients. There are obviously situations where you will want to use um, traditional negative pressure wound therapy. This is patients with uh, chronic ulcers of the lower extremities. Um, so I guess it depends on the wound type. But some very promising um, results there, and obviously it would be good to see some further the research in this area. And I think one of the suggestions for um, why these findings might be um, is that PICO, single-use negative pressure wound therapy, actually delivers compressive forces across and beyond the wound, spanning the entire dressing within 60 millimeters of the wound center line, in comparison to traditional negative pressure wound therapy, which is a more localized therapy to the wound itself and delivers those compressive forces to 35 millimeters of the wound center line. And I think it'll be interesting to see um, as we go forward in our research, um, how this um, applies to clinical practice. But I guess we're seeing advances in negative pressure wound therapy all the time. And, you know, I was saying to Ed before we um, started out tonight that I've been a nurse for 40 years um, this year, and I've been a wound care nurse for 27 of those years. And I've certainly seen many advances um, in wound care and in um, negative pressure wound therapy. And I remember the very first patient that I used um, negative pressure wound therapy on, um, and they had to have, um, they had a, a walking frame with wheels, and they had to have the device on a table on top of that um, and it had a tremendous impact on them just getting around their, their first floor flat and of course they, they couldn't do very much else, they couldn't get out and here we are several years later we've got patients having negative pressure wound therapy, single, single use negative pressure wound therapy we don't even know they're having that therapy because it's so discreet and they're able to get about um, and, and do the things they need to do. So I think what we're seeing with the latest technology is um, pump duration uh, that lasts up to 14 days. Um, it's designed for use in, in much deeper wounds um, and you can use a filler with that um, and enhanced pump action to aid use in large wounds with less user intervention. So technology is moving forward all the time and that really greatly benefits um, accessibility and uh, um, our patients and I guess for all of you as well because one of the things that I found when we first started using negative pressure wound therapy is that some of our community nurses were very anxious because it was quite um, a technical procedure or they saw it as a technical procedure um, but new single-use negative pressure wound therapy de devices really um, don't require us to have um, a great amount of um, technical skill I don't think. So I guess it's how does this benefit the patient um, and I'd like to share some of um, the technology and innovation um, in my evaluations um, of this product. Um, so this is a 44 year old uh, patient who suffers from diabetes and has had a myocardial infarct in the past. Um, she had incision and drainage of an abscess on her back. Um, there was no infection in the wound, and you can see that there isn't any devitalized tissue, but the wound edges um, are not looking particularly healthy. 
On referral, um, the wound was eight centimeters by two centimeters. It was 0.5 deep. And she was having traditional um, neck depression wound therapy. She was having it changed twice a week. And she was a bit fed up of coming on the bus to the dressing clinic and having to carry her device with her. Um, so she was very happy um, to get involved in this evaluation um, and consented to treatment and sharing her story. And at week one, you could see the wound um, had reduced in size. It was five centimeters by one centimeter and quite superficial. The wound edges were starting to look much healthier. By week two, it had reduced further to 4.5 by one centimeter. And this wound had healed um, by week four. And of course, at the same time, we saw a reduction in wound dressings down to once a week. So that was better in terms of the patient having to come out to clinic, but also for the nurse who's got long lists of patients coming to that clinic. And then we do patient reported outcome measures and experience measures and it was 10 across the board for this patient who was extremely happy not only with the treatment but also with uh, the wound healing. Here's another patient, a 36 year old patient with a body mass index of 40 um, who has hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Um, this lady had a hernia repair. She developed a post-op wound infection and a surgical dehiscence. And she was attending the dressing clinic um, and having the dressing done three times a week. Um, the wound was static. It wasn't progressing at the speed that we would expect a surgical dehiscence wound to progress. Um, usually I find these wounds progress quite quickly, but of course she did have quite um, a few factors that would delay that wound from healing. So on initial assessment, the wound was four centimeters by one centimeter and three centimeters deep. Um, there were quite high levels of eight to date and we applied the peak of 14. At week one, the wound was two centimeters by 0.5. So for me, that was quite significant to go from three centimeters deep to um, 0.5 deep. And by week two, it was 1.5 by 0.4 in dimension and 0.3 centimeters deep. And it healed in three weeks. And again, this lady, I mean, I, I can remember this lady whooping for joy in the dressing clinic um, and her patient satisfaction scores were very high. Um, and we say we healed at Christmas. It was um, just before the Christmas period. So for me, it's all about um, doing the best we can for our patients. And if we can get their wounds healed quicker and we can um, relieve the pain, distress and anxiety, then I think we, we've, we've done a good job. So really to draw um, the presentation to a conclusion, um, I hope I've demonstrated in this um, short presentation that hard to heal wounds are challenging for patients. They're challenging for you as clinicians and they really pose a challenge to that wider health economy in terms of uh, the cost and or the burden of chronic wounds. We need to identify patients who are likely to be hard to heal early. So, you know, make that decision, what type of wound and what type of patient have I got here? Is it somebody who's likely to be hard to heal? So that we have that patient um, set up and ready um, for um, advanced wound therapies and early intervention so that we can reduce the time it takes to heal that wound and improve, improve patient outcomes. And I think that helps us with our um, allocation of resources as well, when resources are um, quite precious in our um, health care systems. So I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you all for listening in um, and I'm going to hand back over to Ed and I'm very happy to take your questions um, but I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope that you know we we have a call to action here and we go back to our caseloads tomorrow or next week and we go through those caseloads and we see we ask ourselves the questions of are we doing the right thing for the patients how long have they had the wounds have we assessed them and measured them every four weeks and what could we do differently thank you very much Thank you, Caroline. Um, I thought that was absolutely exceptional. Um, as Caroline alluded to, um, Smith & Nephew have a variety of resources available to you. I believe they should be coming up on the screen now and in the comment box. Um, and thank you to our audience for all your comments and questions. It's massively appreciated. So Caroline, are you happy if I start piling through the questions? Yes, of course, Ed. So our first question from Mary Gold, what type of wounds can you use NPWT on? Okay. 
So that's a very good question, Mary. And I think we've demonstrated in this presentation that we would use negative pressure wound therapy and hard to heal wounds. And I've shared my publication and two other publications of the types of wounds we used it on. So we used it on venous leg ulcers as an adjunct compression therapy. So we use single use negative pressure wound therapy and we put compression on those venous leg ulcers. Um, we used it on surgical and dehist wounds and we used it on um, pressure ulcers. So for those studies and the lower extremity wounds for the American study, but I think I've seen it used um, traditional use neg traditional negative pressure wound therapy you can use on um, lots of different wounds, but I guess in the community we try to use single use if we can, and I've seen some great results with um, flaps and grafts. Um, the other area which I really think we should be doing more work on is closed surgical incisions. So thinking about the patients going into surgery who have a risk of developing dehiscence um, and ensuring that those patients get it prophylactically um, to reduce the chance of them, their wound breaking down. So I I guess um, other wounds, uh, partial thickness burns we mentioned in the presentation, traumatic wounds. Um, I think most use, the only contraindication um, would be if you've got um, a malignant wound. So if you've got a malignancy in the wound bed or the wound margins, um, if you've got confirmed or untreated osteomyelitis, they would, they would be the only wounds, um, fistulas as well, that I would um, not use it on. But, I guess it can be used on most types of wounds. Brilliant, thank you. Um, question two from Beverly. Um, in your experience, have you used NPWT with deeper wounds? And if so, how? So I think there's two um, answers here, Beverly. Um, if you're using traditional negative pressure wound therapy, um, then obviously that's a, a bigger machine and you can use um, a filler. You can use a foam or you can use a gauze filler. Um, and there's indications for when you would use either of those. Um, I think if you've got a wound where there's undermining, um, I would tend to use um, a gauze filler on that patient. Um, so I guess it depends on the, on, on the wound type as to what filler you use and there's lots of guidance on that. Um, with single use negative pressure wound therapy what we're now seeing with the PICA-14 is that you can use it on deeper wounds. So the manufacturers say that you can use it on wounds up to seven centimeters. Um, the wound in the case study I showed you um, was three centimeters deep. So I've used it in three four centimeters deep um, with um, an antimicrobial gauze filler. I hope that answers your question Beverly. Fantastic, thank you. So question three from Claire. Are there any specific pathways that you use for hard to heal wounds? Um, yeah, that's from Claire from Bournemouth. Okay. So I guess in our organization, we have guidelines for um, pressure ulcer prevention management, leg ulcer prevention management, and wound care. And as part of that, we have guidelines in there for management of hard to heal wounds. And we try to use um, critical thinking in terms of our resource allocation. So the PICO pathway that I shared with you that we published would be our pathway for using single use negative pressure wound therapy. But I think key to managing these patients is that assessment, you know, getting that assessment right um, and treating all those other factors. And what I often see in practice is that, you know, I go out to see a patient with a non any wound, but, you know, we haven't done the right things. The patient has, is on the wrong cushion. Um, the patient's not eating well. They haven't had physiotherapy to get them moving. So I think the pathway needs to focus on the whole patient as well as the therapy for the patient. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so next question from Debbie. Uh, at what stage would you stop the negative pressure therapy and change back to a traditional dressing on a wound that is gradually healing? Would you always use this therapy until the wound is healed? That's a good question, Debbie. And I think um, as part of our pathway, I think at the beginning, we didn't have the answers when we started using negative pressure wound therapy. And traditional negative pressure wound therapy for me was very much driven by the consultants in the hospital. So patients came out of hospital with these devices and we picked it up in the community and we managed those patients. Now that we've used, moved over to using more single use negative pressure wound therapy, we have much more control over what patients we use it on. And many of you would be nurse prescribers, so you can prescribe this um, product 
of your patient. So I guess it's about doing that in a responsible way, guided by, I wanted to say guided by the science, but I've been listening to too much of the Prime Minister's brief every night. Um, but it, to some extent, it is guided by um, what the science is telling us. And what we know is that you would expect to see a wound area reduction um, between 10 and 40 percent over a four week period. So that's what we would do. If we're getting no response, the wound's not improving with it, we would stop it and we would refer that patient and get help. If we have a wound area reduction between 10 and 40 percent, then we know that the negative pressure wound therapy is making a difference to that patient. So for some patients that would be two weeks, for some patients that would be four weeks, and for other patients it might be a little bit longer. I think sometimes there's the middle ground of patients where um, you're not seeing that, that instant um, reduction size and you might want to get in a multidisciplinary team to decide um, how, how long to keep going. But certainly once they're healing or on a trajectory to healing, then we would stop that treatment and go back to standard wound care. Brilliant, thank you. Um, next question from Alison. Do we need a N uh, NWPT policy or standard operating procedure in our trusts? Okay. Well, do you? That's a good question. I think lots of us, when negative pressure, you know, we had, I remember doing policies when all of the negative pressure um, treatment started in patients in the community, and we had to do business cases for each individual patient to get the um, resource. That was how hard it was. So we had policies um, for use. Now, I think there's no point in reinventing the wheel. I think there's lots of stuff out there. And certainly our sponsors tonight, um, Smith and Levy, will have a lot of stuff that they will be able to support you with in terms of um, getting this into your clinical practice. But I think if you have got your wound management guidelines, you can integrate um, your pathway for the use of negative pressure wound therapy. But I think it's also worth thinking about your discussions with your commissioners, you know, who's funding it. Um, if it's on FP10, then it's funded through that route. Um, but if you're using traditional negative pressure wound therapy, you have to think about how that gets funded and how the, um, the equipment flows through the system. Brilliant. Um, next question from another Debbie is, can you use negative pressure wound therapy under compression? And if so, is there anything in particular you need to do? So yes, of course you can use it under compression. That's one of the one of the things that um, leg ulcers is my my thing really. I've been looking after patients with leg ulcers for many years, um, and a lot of the work we've done, including that published paper, was in patients with venous leg ulcers um, that were not responding to compression therapy alone. So yes, we would put on um, the single use negative pressure wound therapy, and then what we do is we bring the tubing out. Um, on top of the padding layer. So you can bring it out outside of the compression um, for the patient. So yes, of course, you have to remember that if it's a venous leg ulcer, it will not heal without compression. So we have to have the, the compression therapy as well as the negative pressure wound therapy. Okay, so next one from Ivy. Can I ask in general, before commencing negative pressure wound therapy, if there's bone exposed, but no clinical signs of infection, do we still need to rule out osteomyelitis? Yes, I think, you know, if you look at the contraindications for using single use negative pressure wound therapy, it says there's contraindication where you've got exposed arteries, um, organs, veins. I think if you've got somebody who's got exposed bone, there is the good possibility that they've got osteomyelitis. So I think you would want to um, rule that out and ensure it was treated if the patient has got it. Um, but as long as you've got um, treated osteomyelitis, then you could go ahead and use it. I think for those very complex patients, that should be part of the wider multidisciplinary um, team discussions because they will require um, your diabetologist involved um, and your consultant as well. Okay, so next question from Marina. If you have a patient with a grade four wound, could we use dressings first? or debriding the necrotic tissue and then use negative pressure wound therapy? 
So when you say grade four, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, Marina, that we're talking about a category four pressure ulcer, but certainly you're talking about a deep wound here. So I think one of the contraindications for using negative pressure wound therapy is if you've got necrotic tissue. So of course, you've got to prepare the wound bed. So we do need to do that debridement um, to get rid of that devitalized necrotic tissue before you would use negative pressure wound therapy. And I think the key to success with negative pressure wound therapy is to do that wound bed preparation and how you do that will depend on your patient and your circumstances. But if you've got somebody who's got a very deep wound like that, who's got necrotic tissue, then again, I would have my surgeon involved there. Um, they might want to do the quickest way of debriding that um, with a surgical shock debridement and then get that negative pressure wound therapy on um, as soon as you get that um, healthy wound bed. Brilliant. Um, question from Jane, a great question from, Je from Jane. Uh, do you think these kind of treatments are even more important in the current climate? Yes, very good question. I think, you know, uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic has made us rethink the way we all work. Um, we've all had to think about what's essential work and what's non-essential work. We've had to think about the number of visits. We've had to think about um, treating patients who are positive with um, COVID-19. So I think a, a, a treatment like um, single-use negative pressure wound therapy, um, if it can reduce the number of contacts for that patient, um, then often you can get the patient through the 14-day um, quarantine period um, with that treatment. And of course, the other thing I really like about this treatment is that you can teach patients to use it themselves. Now, you obviously want to monitor that, but I guess I, I know I'm a clinician, but I think I could, um, my family could use single-use negative pressure wound therapy, and I could do this type of consultation. And we're doing a lot of consultations um, over, the, over the web right now for those patients. So you could actually teach patients application and um, putting it on, put, taking it off. So yes, I think um, we're rethinking the way we work, and I think it is an opportunity here um, to do something different. Do you think, I mean, a question from me quickly on that, I've got a slight um, bugbear that the phrase wound management's been used so extensively and not necessarily wound healing. Um, as we know, so much wound healing is done in the community. Do you see negative pressure proliferating in the community in the future? And what do you think have been the main reasons it hasn't quite kicked off with the primary care world? I mean, I think that's a very good point, Ed, and I think I have a bit of a bias because we do use it where I work, um, and I think we have embraced it and we've done our studies. Um, I think more so in the community nursing teams. Um, I think in primary care, it's still not embraced as much as it could be, but I think um, some of our general practices don't do much wound care, you know, and it's not, there's no payment or quaff attached to wound care in general practice. So I think it isn't an area that's as well developed as perhaps it is in community nursing services. But I think we all have a duty to change that. Um, and we do a lot of training with our practice nurses. Thank you, Caroline. Um, so question 10. Can negative pressure wound therapy help patients be discharged from hospital into the community faster? Well, I think there's there's some papers that have been written around this, and I think certainly my early experience was that patients came home much quicker with, for example, dehistorical wounds. So I was I worked in surgery um, before I became a community nurse, and you know those patients would have stayed in hospital for weeks. Um, so I, as a community nurse on the receiving end of that, I saw patients with very big abdominal dehiscence come out into community having traditional use of pressure wound therapy. And I think what I'm seeing more now is that for some patients, we, we can step them down to discharge them, um, or if not, step them down shortly after they've been discharged. So I think it is a great way of getting patients out early. And, you know, if you're a patient, you don't want to be staying in hospital any longer than you need to, particularly right now. Brilliant. Thank you. And now on to our last question. Um, and thank you, everyone, for asking so many questions. I know there's been loads that have been unanswered. We will come back to you all and give the answers to your questions over the next couple of days. So the final question. Ah, um, GPs sometimes block prescriptions for this. Do you have any advice how to get them on side? How to get the GPs on side? Well, I think you should take the publications we talked about tonight. And I think the first conversation, and I don't want to be unkind, is the cost savings. So I think they, the, the, when we're using dressings, um, the conversations I always find are around the cost. 
Um, so if, I think if you can say, we can save you money doing this and we can improve your patient um, outcomes. So I think if you can demonstrate that, and I think, you know, just, just do it on a few patients and have that story ready and your experience as well as the published literature. Um, I mean, GPs are healthcare professionals the same as us. They want the best for their patients, um, but they're obviously conscious of their budget. So if you can have the, 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 the patient improvement conversation, and the cost conversation um, and marry those together, then I think you're much more likely to be successful. The other thing I think uh, that I've been very involved in in the, in the last few years um, is quality improvement. So we do a lot of quality improvement projects um, in East London where I work. And quality improvement projects, you, projects, you start off small and you demonstrate an improvement and a cost saving, and then you build that up. So my advice would be work with one or two GPs who are you know, your, your, your friendly GPs who are interested in all of this, do a little bit of a pilot and a small QI project and then scale it up and spread it um, to the wider community and get your commissioners on board because the commissioners are the ones that will sign off um, ultimately the funding. Caroline, thank you. Caroline, thank you. Um, uh, the whole event, I think, is absolutely brilliant. And I can see by the comments, and please have a look later, but I'm not alone in thinking that. So thank you everyone for your kind words throughout the whole event. Um, the attendance certificate is now available for download. That will appear in the comments bar and also on the screen now. Um, and for more information, education and events like these, please visit our website, um, www.woundcare-today.com. Um, so that concludes tonight's event. A huge thank you to Caroline. Thank you so much. Um, have a good evening. Um, thank you again to Smith and Nephew for all your support. And a big thank you to my amazing team um, at Wound Care Today and Mole Digital for another amazing event. And last but no means least, to you incredible healthcare professionals, what you do continues to humble me and continues to inspire the nation. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Stay safe, stay strong, and we'll see you again very soon. Good night.